Well, it's 6 o'clock, and it's Tuesday, and this is Tyra Ann Tolick with Truth Attack Hour, where religion, politics, and the law are mentioned always only one breath. And I want to thank you so much for tuning in. I have so much to talk about. It is just totally incredulous. And last week, I wasn't able to finish the show. Well, I did finish the show, but I didn't say everything I wanted to say. You know what I mean? And if you want to call the show, the number is 410-848-9191. But I got so much stuff this week that I might have to, you know, roll it over for next week. But that's a good thing because then you can, uh, you know, tune in next week and see where I'm headed with all this wonderful stuff. Last week, oh, 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 before I forget. You can find us on YouTube. Just do a search on Liberty Works Radio Network, and a bunch of our shows are there. And they're archiving previous shows, so you'll see a bunch of mine, Larry B. Craft, and a whole bunch of other people. And so now we're there, and you can hear the previous shows. So many people have been asking me, hey, do you archive, do you archive? For three years asking me, do you archive? Well, it finally has come. Don't forget to donate. Because this is work. It's not just sitting around punching, you know, little numbers and little buttons and all this. People need to eat, so by all means, send in some of your donations and become a, you know, member of the fellowship. Hey, we got a lot of stuff that you won't get anywhere else. All right, so last week, if you can find last week's on YouTube, listen to it because it's going to... You know, this one dovetails from that one. It's the uh, October 13th show, and uh, it will give you a background. But I want to just recap a few things from last week's show so that I can continue on. I wrote, and my producer says, oh, that affidavit is way too long. But you know what? I don't care because 12 pages is everything that I want to say. And it's all in there, and it sets out the entire progression of logic as to why I do not want to use a social security number. And it has to do with the kingdom of God. And a lot of people, when I tell them about this stuff, they look at me cross-eyed and say, well, can you please get to some spiritual stuff now? Well, as the show progresses, you'll see how spiritual it's going to be. Because we don't realize the spirituality of something until events emerge that begin to bleep on the spiritual radar that we have read from the scriptures for years and years and years and didn't make any sense, didn't relate to it because the events had not emerged yet. They didn't surface, they didn't bubble up yet, but now they're bubbling up. Okay, so don't think that I'm, you know, a kook or something because these things are really happening. Um, I spoke today to Alex Newman and I'm going to interview him next week. I read his book, Crimes of the Educators, with uh, Dr. Blumenberg, who was the the uh, originator of homeschooling, and he just passed away uh, well, was a few weeks ago or something to that effect. And I wanted to have him, but I, obviously I can't. But I will have Alex. And I called him today. He's in Spain right now. And we discussed all of these things. And he directed my attention to a bunch of articles, global in nature, about what I'm talking that is very spiritual, very spiritual. So here's the background that I gave last week. And a lot of these definitions are from Black's Law Dictionary. They're not from Webster's. They're not stuff that I make up. It's from Black's Law. And I'm going to run through some of these definitions so that you would understand where I'm headed with this. And I'm going to make it very spiritual, but it's very political, and it has a whole lot of legal implications. Okay, the word church, that is defined in Black's Dictionary. And it says this, the religious society founded and established by Jesus Christ to receive, preserve, and propagate his doctrine and Ordinances. The word ordinances is a legal term. Okay? It also defines it as a body or community of Christians united under one form of government by the profession of the same faith, the observance of the same rituals and ceremonies. So it's a government, 
and it has ordinances. Well, we all know that in Psalms 119, there are more words related to the governing of this kingdom of God than just ordinances. It, it uses the word law, commandments, judgments, statutes, word. You know, that's five. So six words at least are used to refer to the the system of governance of this church, that God was the one said, these are my statutes, these are my ordinances, these are my judgments, these are my commandments, this is my law, and I want you to follow them. And he was what? He was the executive, the legislative, and the judicial all wrapped up in one. There was no checks and balances with him. No division of powers with him. He had it all in one being, right? So, okay, keep that in mind, a form of government and uh, to propagate his doctrines and ordinances. The word worship is also defined in blacks, and it's, quote, any form of religious service showing reverence for divine being or exhortation to obedience to or following of the mandates of such being, the mandates of such being. Okay, so how do you follow the mandates of a being? He has to say it, there has to be an imposition of duty, and then you do it, right? Well, Black's Law Dictionary also defines belief-action dis distinction, and they define it as the distinction noted in analysis of cases under the First Amendment, U.S. Constitution, freedom of speech and religion, to the effect that one is guaranteed the right to any belief he chooses. But when the belief is translated into action, obedience, to follow the mandates, the state also has rights under its police power to protect others from such actions. Well, if you were to read the Bible, the mandates of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the things that are stated there that do not pertain to the temple, the priesthood, and the sacrifices are all doable today, and they're not going to harm anybody. I don't know of one right off the top of my head, that would harm somebody else or would violate somebody else's right. But, of course, of late, one of those mandates, the intragender marriage, does go counter to God's law. But they're not going to be harmed because God's law says if you do this, God's going to punish you, not man. God is. You're in trouble with him. But nobody is going to kill you. His people are not going to kill you. They might say, I don't want to associate with you. But you're not going to suffer any lack of rights in performing whatever you want to do because you're going to do it anyway. They're not going to stop you because you're, the only one that can stop you is yourself. Obedience is internal, not mandated externally. So, all right, so when it's translated into action, uh, beliefs and action have no distinction because the belief and the action have to happen. If you read the book of James, it says if you don't have action, your belief is as if it were dead, that it did not exist because that's the only way you will know what's inside your head, or anybody else for that matter, would know what's inside your head. What beliefs are inside your head is by your actions. So, all right. Another word defining blacks is the word worldly. And they, they define it as of or pertaining to the world or the present state of existence, temporal, earthly, devoted to, interested in, or connected with this present life, and its cares, advantages, and pleasures to the exclusion of those that are of a future life, concerned with enjoyment of this present existence or secular 
not religious, spiritual, or holy. That's in Black's Dictionary. They could have they could have not put those parts in there about religion or future life or spiritual or holy. They, they didn't have to do that. But since they have to go from what they can extract from court decisions, obviously court decisions said that. All right. The word citizen, and this is, oh, this one brings up a lot of, you know, fringe arguments that I'm not going to get into, but the word citizen is defined as one who, under the Constitution and laws of the United States, or of a particular state, is a member of a political community. Oh, did we remember the word church? It says a member of a society. Okay, now it continues here. Owing allegiance and being entitled to the enjoyment of full civil, and I put in brackets, in the Declaration of Independence known as unalienable rights, submitting themselves to the dominion of a government for the promotion of their general welfare and the protection of their individual, a.k.a. unalienable rights. So when you say you're a citizen, it is legally recognized as you owing allegiance and being under the dominion of the government to whom you hold allegiance. The word allegiance means obligation of fidelity and obedience to government in consideration for protection that government gives. Oh, well, hey, didn't God say, you shall have no other God before me, you shall make no image and worship them, because I am your God who took you out of the land of Egypt, and we believe in that same God, and he says, I'll protect you. Obey me, and you're going to win every war. Disobey me, and you might get slaughtered. Obey me, and I'll protect you. But I want fidelity. I want allegiance. I want allegiance. Now, when you look up the word faith in the Hebrew, it means fidelity, which also means loyalty. So as you see, two camps are emerging. Two camps are being defined here, the allegiance, fidelity, loyalty to the worldly government, and allegiance and fidelity and loyalty to the kingdom of God, the holy, the spiritual. And for the longest time, those two were okay in America, maybe the colonial period. And I'm not going to get into, you know, the... The, the witch hunts and and some other stuff, but for for general application, it, it was doing okay. At least the worldly government recognized the spiritual, holy, and you know, godly government, heavenly government. So. I want to continue here because I I want to start to connect these things, and these things are important. As for me and anybody else that uh, that is an immigrant and took the oath of citizenship, this is what we're going to go into now, all right, because Title VIII, subsection 1448, parents A, defines what the oath of allegiance is but I'm not going to read it right now (laughs) because I hear the music. And so I'm not going to get into it right this minute, but I will on the other side of the break. So, like I always say, don't touch that webpage. Don't touch that dial. Show 410 848 9191. I got to the part of Title VIII, 
section 1448A of the United States Code that talks about the oath of citizenship that I took back in 1976, and everybody that wants to be a citizen most likely took. And this is what it says. It says, an oath, number one, to support the Constitution of the United States, number two, to renounce and abjure absolutely and entirely all allegiance and fidelity. Well, I was talking about allegiance and fidelity before, right? Allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, sovereignty. Is God not sovereign? Is he not a sovereignty? Of whom or which the applicant was before a subject or citizen? Is there not citizenship in the kingdom of God? Because I know at least two scriptures that talk about that. Number three, to support and defend the constitutions and the laws of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Number four, to bear true faith and allegiance. Oh, there they are again. Two, the same. And number five, to bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by law. That was subsection 5A and then 5B, to perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the United States when required by law. And C, to perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by law. That same section says defines the term religious training and belief. And it says this that as used in this section, it shall mean an individual's belief in a relation to a supreme being involving duties superior to those arising from any human relation, but does not include essentially political, sociological, philosophical views or a merely personal moral code. Well, if the law of God includes moral code, that it's no longer personal, right? It's his, and he imposes it. So when I took that oath, nowhere in any part of my mind did I ever believe, because I was already a Christian then at least 19 years, um, that I was, you know, abhorring and renouncing my Allegiance and fidelity to God. Nowhere did I ever, that never, I did not go there. It did not occur, it did not happen. All right, so what does all of that have to do with the Social Security number and with a driver license and with everything that that number represents in our society today? Well, I'm going to go, oh, 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 before I forget, i got to go back all the way to the top of this 12-page mammoth affidavit that somebody's going to hate to read. Um, it's international law, Article 5 of the Treaty of Amity, Settlement, and Limits between the United States of America and His Catholic Majesty in 1819 between the United States of America and His Catholic Majesty which guarantees that, quote, the inhabitants of the ceded territories, part of which, and this is my brackets in there, part of which includes the land of Florida, shall be secure in the free exercise of their religion without any restriction. Now, a treaty is contract law pushed up to the level of international, between nations, that's the law of nations. Just like if I have a contract with you, it's the law of of Kyra and you. And that is the agreement that we came to. We understood the meanings of the words, we understood the obligations and and we if we follow them and not breach them, we're okay. Well that's what this is. And that treaty only has to do with the entire state of Florida, the land of Florida, and the coastal areas, you know, several miles in, but of the state of Mississippi and Alabama, because at that time, all of that was considered East and West Florida. Okay, so that treaty was a slam dunk. That was the agreement. The parties agreed to those stipulations, and Article 4 says that it guaranteed the inhabitants, it didn't qualify the inhabitants, it just said the inhabitants of the ceded territories shall be secure in the free exercise of their religion without any restriction. 
without any restriction. Now, if you were to go to Revelation 13 and you were to read, you know, what qualifies the number of the beast is that they who don't have it cannot buy or sell. That's the qualifier. That's how you would identify it. That's why you would know its function. All right? Well, Section 5, Title 42, Section none other than 666, says that it requires a recording of Social Security numbers in certain family matters uh, and is the procedure requiring that Social Security number of any applicant for a driver license under the Part D requirement for statutory prescribed procedures to improve effectiveness for child support enforcement. So they're connecting, I mean, the, the, the state departments of revenue already have connected the driver license with child support or alimony. So now they're, they're making it a national thing that that's what they want. Well, you can't work without uh, a driver license because even though you were not required to get, I'm sorry, without a social security number, because even though you were not required by, to get that number, because if you were required, then everybody would have been issued one without any application. So if you have an option to apply, that means that you have an option not to apply and not to get one. But to be able to function out of necessity, you need the darn thing. You need it, but it's not a government-required thing. But they've made it so that even though you're not required, you better have it or you're not going to be able to buy and sell. Well, I'm going to go into this court case, which is extremely interesting. And I, I found it as a fluke. I, I don't even remember what search I was doing on the search engine for, for court cases where I found this. And this is a... 1796 case, and it's the very first case that the Supreme Court of this country had to address the Supremacy Clause, Article 6 of the National Constitution. Okay? And the Supremacy Clause is this. It says that all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, which, you know, that's what happened uh, with, oh, that treaty with Florida and the Pope and all that. It's all the so-called the uh, adams onis Treaty, because those were signers to this thing. So, that all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme court, uh, law of the land. And judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. So it doesn't just say about state law. It also talks about state constitutions. But that first case, this first case had to do with a state law, Virginia law, that violated the Treaty of Paris, which was the treaty that uh, pretty much ended, officially ended, the Revolutionary War. And it had to do with um, Article 4. And Article 4 of that treaty says, it is agreed that creditors on either side shall meet with no lawful impediment to the recovery of the full value in sterling money of all bona fide debts theretofore contracted. So if there was a contract and there was, there was a British creditor and an American debtor, that British creditor could still come and say, hey, pay up. But Virginia uh, enacted a law saying the opposite, totally the opposite. And so what this, what this uh, case um, dealt with, it says how can... Uh, I want to read this. The right to repeal was only admitted by the counsel of the defendants in error. That's the way they use defendants in errors are the ones that appeal something. Because a repeal would not affect their case, but 
on the same ground that the treaty can repeal a law of a state, it can nullify it. I have already proved that a treaty can totally annihilate any part of the Constitution of any of the individual states that is contrary to a treaty. Oh, yummy. I just love it. I love it, I love it, I love it. And this is what it says, uh, the four things that the writer of this opinion, and I don't, in those days, all the justices wrote. It wasn't one justice writing for everybody. Everybody wrote something. So it says four things are apparent in a view of this sixth article of the National Constitution. First, that it is retrospective. And it is to be considered in the same light as if the Constitution had been established before the making of the Treaty of 1783. Second, that the Constitution or laws of any of the states so far as either of them shall be found contrary to the treaty are by force of said article prostrate before the treaty. That means they fall flat on their face. Number three, that consequently the Treaty of 1783 has superior power to the legislative legislature of any state because no legislature of any state has any kind of power over the Constitution, which was its creator. And number four is the more important one. Fourthly, that it is the declared duty of the state judges to determine any Constitution or laws of the state contrary to that treaty or any other made under the authority of the United States null and void. National or federal judges are bound by duty and oath to the same conduct. So what treaty am I going to be talking about? I'm going to be talking about the Adam Onis Treaty because the same thing applies here. So Here's the Constitution of Florida, and I, and I would love and challenge you to look up your own um, treaties on how lands were acquired in your particular state and see if any of them have the protection that Florida has, because I think this is awesome. Anyways, this is the 1838 treaty, uh, I mean, uh, the Constitution for Florida. It says this under under individual rights that all men have a natural and inalienable right to worship almighty god according to the dictates of their own conscience and that no preference shall ever be given by law to any religious establishment or mode of worship in this state but now look at the constitution that currently exists and it says this article section three there shall be no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting or penalizing the free exercise thereof. Here's the problem. Religious freedom shall not justify practices, i.e. actions, inconsistent with public morals, peace, and safety. The word that bothers me in that sentence is safety because that's what they're going to go to with the driver license. I'll connect all of this on the next segment. And I have a feeling that I'm not going to finish everything that I had ready for today, but that's a good thing. So don't go away. I'll be right back. Okay. Thanks for staying on with me here. I had read a portion of the Ware versus Hilton case of 1796, which was the first case that dealt with the supremacy clause of the National Constitution of Article 6. And basically what it says that if there's any state or um, state constitutional law that is contrary to a treaty, then that portion of the Constitution or law needs to fall prostrate before the treaty because the treaty is superior. Now, um, I compared the wording of the Florida Constitution in 1838, that all men have a natural and inalienable right to worship Almighty God according to the dictates of their own conscience and 
that no preference shall be ever given by law to any religious establishment or mode of worship in this state. But the current one says there shall be no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting or penalizing the free exercise thereof. But the section of it that I think goes contrary to the treaty is this. Religious freedom shall not justify practices inconsistent with public morals, peace, or safety. And that word safety, what, DMV, the Department of Highway uh, and Motor Vehicle Safety. And they say, well, we've got to have the Social Security number because they need a driver license to promote safety. Of course, I would ask, well, how much safer is submitting that Social Security number going to make me or the public? Obviously, just the mere use of it is not going to, but there are things that are going on behind the scenes that it, they could be woven in. But I would argue that the federal Title 42, um, yeah, Section 666, and the Florida statutes, um, Section 322.031 and 322.082A, that last one is the one that falls under the compliance with the Real ID Act, that those two are in violation of the treaty, and they must fall prostate, prostrate, what is it? <laughs> prostrate. Before the treaty, I get those two wonderful words mixed up. My Cuban kicks in. Okay, so anyway, I had to make you laugh, okay, at least a little bit. This is such heavy-duty stuff. All right, so um, what's going on then with Title 42, driver license, Social Security number? Well, my friend Alex Newman and I spoke about that today, and he directed and pointed my nose to other things that are going on behind the scenes, and one of them is this, is public law 142-24 that got passed June 12th of this year, and it's called, it's called Girls Count Act of 2015. And this is what the act says. Coordination with multilateral organizations, the secretary and the administrator are authorized to coordinate with the World Bank, relevant United Nations agencies and programs, and other relevant organizations to encourage and work with countries to enact, implement, and enforce laws that specifically collect data on girls and establish registration programs to ensure girls are appropriately counted and have the opportunity to be active participants in the social, legal, and political sectors of society in their countries. Whoa, collecting data. You know where they're going to start that if they haven't already? In school. And there have been already some cases that I covered maybe two years ago of a schoolgirl who had to wear this badge with all kinds of a barcode or a chip that had all kinds of information about, on her, uh, especially the Social Security number. And the father said, no, it ain't happening because of what? Revelation 13. And so the school district came to an agreement. But those kids had to wear that badge even if they were off campus, all right? The registration of girls. But this whole section here, this whole act also includes boys, also includes women. And it's all under the guise of um, preventing uh, hunger, poverty, and the registration is none other than the birth certificate. And that's why hospitals today get all bent out of shape when the parent says, I don't want a Social Security number for my kid. Thank you very much. But no, they want to shove it down your throat. But, of course, you know, it's voluntary. You know, it's like so screwed up. All right. Sweden is the number one country in going cashless, all right? It is the number one 
country in the globe that only 7% of the people use bank cards or cash. I'm sorry, 7% use bank cards, but they're quickly going to where you can't use cash. And that's what they want. So Sweden is, is, is you know, blazing through. India, here's another one. India, people over there are having conniptions. India has 1.2 billion people in it, okay? And now they want to do the unique identification authority of India. And it's a um, ID number card with biometric data, fingerprints, iris scan, personal information, and a microchip for easy scanning. Oh, yay. And it's going to cost, according to them, $3 billion. Probably it's going to cost more. The unique ID is soft infrastructure, much like mobile telephones. Important to connect individuals with broader economy. But the problem is that it's going to, at least in India, solidify the caste system. It's going to help with profiling. And the system could eventually be used for payments, possibly even to phase out cash transactions and to provide for benefits. So the scary thing about this is that Americans are going to the phones and digital gadgets and convenience and all of this stuff to where you won't need cash to what function in this society. But how would you buy and sell stuff in a cashless society? There has to be a credit transfer from one computer to another. My mom, my poor mom of 85 years old, she waits for the a certain day of the month to where her card is loaded up again with credits to buy food. But there's no cash. So how do you think they're going to identify you? It's going to be with another number that a computer can read. So you got Sweden, you got in, uh, um, India, and there are other countries. You, um, Nigeria, is another one. That is, it's all over the world. The evolution of a cashless society is what's happening before our eyes. The Better Than Cash Alliance which purports to empower people by shifting from cash to electronic payments, but that I'm telling you, that's not empowering. It's only conveniencing them. But when you're a slave, you're not empowered because they got at any time could cut, electronically cut your supply of credits. Okay. The United Nations is also at the heart of the plot with a UN Capital Development Fund serving as the Alliance Secretariat. And the Alliance is um, a group of companies like the Ford Foundation, Bill Gates, Citibank, and Visa. Other UN outfits involved in the scheme include the World Food Program and the United Nations Development Program. So how do you think that this is going to this is going to work without a number? So England has its number, it's the uh social in insurance number, I think they call it, and Sweden has theirs and Greece has theirs and we have ours and Nigeria has theirs and India has theirs. But they're all going to interface. And without that number, what is it that you're not going to be able to do? Buy and sell anything because it's going to be computerized. You won't have cash in your hand. 
that you might be able to barter because you'll have an item of substance that you can exchange for another item of substance. But if you can't buy and sell, how long would this substance last? Some other countries are Colombia, Kenya, Afghanistan, Peru, the Philippines. And so am I being unspiritual now because I bring these things up? Because I'm talking about some governmental thing? Am I against government? No, absolutely not. I, I don't even know why anybody would say that. I mean, was Amer were the colonies against government when they went against, you know, the king? No, they were against what he was doing. Not by against government generally. How stupid can people be? And I'll never forget my professor at FAU in constitutional law. Oh. He was talking about how the founding the, the founders were were um, treasonous. That he wasn't using that word. So I raised my hands and said, okay, so. The, Dr. Tunick, what you're saying is that the the founders were, were treasonous, and he said, oh, yes. And I said, oh, okay, just checking. And I'll tell you what, the man was speechless. He didn't know what to do with himself. And so was the rest of the class. Oh, okay, Dr. Tunick, I just wanted to know that that's what you were saying. So who's, who is the terrorist? Terrorist is in the eyes of the beholder, you know. Just like a hero is in the eyes of the beholder. But that is no new thing. That is in all of, um, of human history. When there's a controversy, somebody, one party has to be the hero, and the other party has to be the terror terrorist uh, on the flip side of both sides. You know, they, they both look at each other in that way, or, or, or themselves. So why am I here in America from Cuba? Oh, because the government over there was messing with us. Why is it that human rights violations are important? Because if they were not important, then there would be no terrorists and there would be no heroes. It's amazing, folks. It is spiritual, it is legal, and it is political. Thank you so much for staying with me on this wonderful show. And don't forget next week, Alex Newman with Crimes of the Educators. Have a great rest of the week. Bye.